Welcome to AB3 Speaks with Monica Antakia, the podcast on academic business and branding, where we talk about planning, building, running, and growing a business as Black academic women who want to share their knowledge with the world. I'm Takia Nur Amin, academic success strategist, dance scholar, and lover of all things luxury. I'm Monica A. Coleman, professor, religious leader, and mom to an active growing kid. We have over 25 years combined experience of sharing our academic knowledge beyond the classroom, and we're telling you all the things we wish someone had told us. We will share our values-led ways of monetizing your advanced education in today's global marketplace and highlight Black academic women who are doing this with excellence and flair. So stay hydrated, make sure you have something to write on and write with, because class is in session. I am so excited about this episode of AB3 Speaks because today I get to interview my amazing co-host, the brilliant, the phenomenal, the exciting Reverend Dr. Monica A. Coleman. On the syllabus today, we will learn about not only her trajectory as an academic, but also what really undergirds and directs her work in the world as an entrepreneur. So glad to have you with us today. Glad to be on our podcast, but not as a host. Okay, let's jump right in and get started. There are pieces of this story that I know, but every time I hear it, I'm excited because um, I think your trajectory is exciting and also unusual. So talk to us about your academic training, where you came from, how you ended up in this moment. Well, I think I identify most as a religion scholar. And so I would call myself a religion scholar in terms of what do I do academically in the world? But I did not grow up thinking when I grow up, I want to be a professor. I did not think when I grow up, I want to be a religious leader. It just never occurred to me. I grew up in Black Baptist and AME churches. And if you were really liked church, like I was a kid who really liked church, the thought was one day you can be Sunday school superintendent. And that's not a bad thing because we had really amazing Sunday school superintendents who were usually teachers or professors because I grew up in a college town in Michigan. So it wasn't that I thought that's a bad thing, but I never thought of myself as clergy. So I'm not doing anything of what I thought I would do, except maybe writing. I think I thought I might be a writer. But I thought when I thought about writer, I thought about novels because that's what I read. And I am not a novelist. (laughs) So, you know, when I went to college, I went to college to go into business, actually. I thought I would go into corporate business. I was good at math. I was good at science. I was a teenager right around the time that the National Science Foundation decided there weren't enough Black scientists and engineers, and they were funding programs for Black kids to learn about coding. And coding wasn't coding, it was programming, right? It was like COBOL and Fortran and and that kind of thing. Um, And so I would do these programs because they were free and they were on college campuses. They got me out of the house and my parents couldn't say no because they were free, right? I did business programs and I don't know that I wasn't interested. I just did them because I could. And as I was applying for college, I was like, well, I have good grades in these these areas and I've got good test scores in these areas and sure, let's do this. And my dad uh, was an automotive executive. And so I thought business was kind of cool. I didn't, not like I shadowed him, but I was like, okay, I get business. He taught me how to read the Wall Street Journal as a kid. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to go to corporate business. And I went to college to major in math and economics. And this is what I was going to do, whatever college I went to. Now, the other part, though, is that I loved Black studies without really knowing it was Black studies. Um, My parents were those people who protested on their college campuses in the late 60s for the things that eventually became Black studies departments and Black student unions. And my mom's an educator. She's a teacher. She had a PhD. She got her PhD when I was young. So I went to classes with her 
I was sitting on the floor coloring while she was in class. She wrote her dissertation on a typewriter. And the fact that it was an electric typewriter was what was a big deal. And I knew it was such a big deal. I knew it was hard to get a PhD. And my mom would call it her second child because I was the only child that she could birth. And this PhD was her second child. But my mother was a public school educator. She was not a professor when I was growing up. She was a teacher. Uh, she taught what we now call middle school, was in junior high school, what was then called remedial reading. She was great at teaching the Black boys who everyone else gave up on. They connected with her. She just, she was really good at that. And she later was uh, an administrator in K-12 public schools. So I didn't automatically think PhD equals university professor. That was just not how I thought of it necessarily. And it wasn't part of my mom's plan to get a PhD. She was, her plan was to be a public school teacher. And then she's like, well, here I am. And I didn't have four kids. So let's go ahead and get this PhD. So I was familiar with universities and that kind of thing. But I think my parents had these interests. At least my mother really had an interest. And my father was kind of a Black history major, but they didn't call it Black history. He went to Howard and it was just history, but he learned Black history when he was at Howard. So I was always around Black literature, Black history. These were the books that were in my house. Uh, I remember we would drive to and from school. My mom would play Jawanza Kanjufu's cassette recording of The Conspiracy to Destroy Black Boys, volume one, two, and three. We took after school classes on, you know, classical African civilization, reading Dr. Ben. And that was just something I did. We did as kind of part of my extra education. I don't think my parents ever expected school to do everything um, that they thought I should know. And so, and I did it with my mom. These are classes my mom and I took together. And so this was always kind of part of who I was as well. And I fell in love with Black literature, um, probably sometime in high school. I remember clearly the books that changed the way I thought about the world. Uh, James Baldwin's Go Tell It on the Mountain, Toni Morrison's Song of Solomon. And when I read a book, I believe it, whether it's fiction or not, I, I'm in that world. I believe it's happening. And what I liked about both of those books really was how they talked about religion. Um, and in very different ways, but both how they talked about religion and faith and belief and blackness and the feeling they evoked when I read them. And that's what I studied in my kind of high school. It wasn't a thesis. We could do high school projects. So I had this high school project. And like you, I love libraries. My mother said that I once said the smartest people in the world were librarians because they knew how to find anything. That's still true, by the way. And I was doing, my parents were poor grad students when I was a kid. Like, so we did free stuff, right? And the free stuff was the public library summer reading program. So I was always in a library. My mom was a grad student when I was young. So I was in the library with her. And I was very clear that you do research when you want to learn something new. And I enjoyed reading books and even at one point, I was writing a column for the local library's newsletter where I was reviewing Black women authored books. And I enjoyed Black literary criticism for fun because I really was always a nerdy kid. Let's not pretend that wasn't the case. Um, I don't think I knew that was a bad thing. No, I knew it was a bad thing. I knew it was like not, I was not the cool kid. I was never the cool kid. I was never the popular kid. I was a kid in the corner with a book. Um, that's who I was. <laughs> and so I went to college to be a math and economics major. And I had taken so much math in high school. I actually tested out of the math in college. I had done BC calculus and AP exams. I took an economics course. It was at eight o'clock in the morning. I was partying like it was 1999. And at some deep level, I think I had problems with capitalism, whatever it was, this was not the class for me. It was that 900 person weed out course and it weeded me out. I was like, I don't think I even understand this little bar and this chart and I'm working too hard for a B minus. Like this is not what's supposed to happen. <laughs> and I went, I did my undergraduate work at Harvard University. 
And the year I started was the first year that Henry Louis Gates came to Harvard. And I knew who Henry Louis Gates was because I was reading Black literary criticism for fun as a teenager. And I was like, oh, he's the guy who wrote, you know, The Signifying Monkey. And he's the guy who wrote Reading Black, Reading Feminist or edited that volume, which my mother had given me as a Christmas gift one year. And so I was kind of, you know, fangirling, even though we didn't use that language back then. Um, but I knew who he was. And I took as an elective a course in the Harlem Renaissance, and I loved it. Uh, it was a literature course. It was in African-American studies. And I found out I could major in African-American studies. And so I don't think I knew I could major in what I liked. Not that I didn't like business, but I didn't know I could major in the thing that was my hobby that I loved. And so, of course, this is the major that you know, Skip Gates was pushing at the time. And because I was hanging out with him because I wanted to. And whenever I could, I would just go to the departments, just hang out the office hours, just sit outside his door and wait for him to come back so we could have conversations. And I was like, I can major in this. Are you kidding? Um, and so we call them concentrations. And you don't decide until your sophomore year what you're going to do. So I decided I wanted to do this. My parents were like, you want to what? <laughs> And they were not at all happy about it. I did not know that they had protested for these departments. You would never have known that because they were like, you need to go to school to get a job. You are not going to get a job studying Black people. And why are we paying Harvard money for you to study Black people? You could study Black people at the local state university. They were like, well, maybe you could like minor in that. Maybe you could like minor in economics. Maybe, you know, how do we help you get a job? Because they were still people who go to school to get a job. and. I didn't really know what I was going to do with it. I hadn't thought that far. And so when they said, what are you going to do? I said, I'm a teach. I didn't really believe it, but I figured that was a good answer. <laughs> and so I was like, yeah, I'm a, I'm a teach. And I kept getting opportunities and fellowships that showed them that I could get these scholarships in the summer. So I didn't, I was out of their pocket <laughs> in the summer out of their pocketbook, so to say, um, because I got to these programs that were targeted toward helping underrepresented minorities like Black people go into the academy. And I wasn't really sure I wanted to do it, but I got chances to research and to craft my own projects and to work with these great scholars like Thaddeus Davis and Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham and Anthony Appia and Dr. Gates and to get a taste of it. And I was like, this is cool. And the more I said it, the better it sounded to myself, the more I believed it. And I was like, yeah, I'm gonna be a professor. I had professors who just believed in me, who completely kicked my ass from here to Timbuktu and back. And I loved what I learned. I had great teachers. I learned great subject matter. I got to explore a lot of different topics. And I think I wanted to be that for other people. I wanted to also um, do these things that I thought would be transformative or I hoped would be transformative. And it turned out I actually liked the things that academics do. I like teaching. I like writing. I like research. And I like. I think I would kind of do them anyway. I didn't feel like I had to do them. I was like, I like this. And I was looking at PhD programs, but I couldn't figure out what kind of PhD to get because I wasn't that focused yet either. And there weren't, there was like one program in the country to get a PhD in African-American studies. And I was told, which was true at the time, I would not be very employable with two degrees in African-American studies at the time because it was still very, jobs were very focused around discipline. And I didn't really know if I had a discipline. I liked English. I liked anthropology. I liked, I liked different, I didn't know what I was going to do. And as it turned out, I was still church girl and I felt a calling to ordain ministry near the end of my college career. And I was like, you know, I'm gonna go get an MDiv. <laughs> and I thought that I would go to divinity school at some point because I had questions about religion and I wanted answers, but I was like, I can do that as a postdoc. So I was like, well, I could do it now because I don't know what else I'm going to do. And it wasn't required by my denomination. But I thought, I have questions. I want to know stuff. This would be a good thing to do. And I applied for MDiv programs. And I did my master's of divinity at Vanderbilt University Divinity School. At the time, I also received a certificate in religion, gender, and sexuality while I was there. After I finished that degree and 
that was my chance to really learn about religion academically. I had taken courses in religion, but I thought religion was church history and Bible, neither of which were deep interests of mine, even though they're good to know. And then I got to divinity school and I found out there were all these other subfields that nobody told me about. I was like, y'all have a PR problem because I found out about theology and ethics and worship and homiletics and all these different things that I didn't know about. And I fell in love with theology. I had great professors and the theology was kind of my thing, but I was also tired when I finished. I was young. I had gone straight through. I'd had some challenging life experiences. I was trying to figure out what it meant to be a minister. And I learned very quickly that I was not, school doesn't teach you how to be a minister. It gives you a lot of information and education so that you have tools and um, tools, I would say, but it doesn't teach you how to be a minister. I think that's just an experiential thing. And so I spent two years after I finished my MDiv as in full-time ministry as a freelance, but I didn't get paid full-time. I just worked full-time as a freelance, a freelance writer. I did some marketing for small business, small black owned businesses. I worked uh, as an advocate in domestic violence programs. I had um, I was a lead on a nonprofit that worked with survivors of sexual violence, and it was wonderful, great, deeply underpaid work with a high burnout rate, but I still loved it, and I would have continued to do it. I was also adjuncting, <laughs> I forgot that, in Africana Studies at a historically Black university that was also a public land grant university, and adjuncting, I could even tell back then in the 90s, where I shared an office with who knows how many other people and kind of held office hours. I was like, I need a real office. I need to put my books in here. I need to be a real life professor where I'm not like borrowing a table. <laughs> right? I wanted to have an office that had my name on the door. And I realized, well, I guess I should do this now. And I had a, a mentor, Sally McFaig, who said, you know, what could you do for 30 years and not get bored? She goes, you're young. What would you do for 30 years? And I said, oh, well, that's a good question because the other topics that interested me were like five-year interests. <laughs> but theology, I thought I could do a topic and then get bored and do another topic and then get bored and do something else in that field. And that's also when I began to fall in love with process theology, a certain kind of philosophical theology. And I did my PhD in philosophy of religion and theology at Claremont Graduate University, which is in Southern California. And that's when I guess I became known as a process theologian. I am also a Black liberation theologian, a womanist theologian. Um, I think that sounds right. I somewhere in there became ordained clergy. So I'm an ordained clergy member as well and started looking for jobs. And I didn't have a preference. I didn't feel like, oh, I should work at historic. I didn't know if I wanted to work at a small liberal arts college, a historically black university or a research one university. I didn't have a preference. Um, so I my through a number of serendipitous actions, I ended up at Bennett College for Women, which was a job I loved deeply. And after that, I worked in graduate theological education for nearly 15 years before my position now, where I am a full professor in the Department of Africana Studies at a state university. I love that story. And I have to say that um, Part of what excites me about it is because it's very clear that you were thoughtful and planful in many ways, but also some of it was just life, lifing. You know, I didn't have a preference on the kind of institution. Yeah, because your preference was job. I mean, Man, I wanted health insurance so bad. <laughs> I right. had health, I had health, I had health challenges through my doctoral program. And I was like, I need health insurance. That's what a sister needs. <laughs> So I think I think that resonates with so many people. It's also funny to hear you talk about this because, you know, let's embarrass my co-host, who's like wildly accomplished and a big deal. And every time I'm out in the world and anybody, I mention her, they always go, you know her? Or that Monica Coleman? The Monica Coleman? And I'm always like, yes, my friend, I can text her right now. Like, it's very exciting to hear you talk about 
that trajectory because people need to understand that it's not all, you know, do drops and gum drops and, and perfect afternoons that the people we see who have these amazing careers and um, have done amazing work. Um, it isn't just because you were granted some gift from on high that made it all easy. That sounded like a lot of work and struggle and push through and resilience on your part to even make it to here. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So now that we have all of that, it's also very clear to me that you could be doing lots of other things. You could have taken your career, your knowledge, your six published books, thank you, into a range of different directions. What is it that makes you want to strike out entrepreneurially? Or what was it that said, you know, this is not enough. I need to also cultivate a business possibility for myself. You know, in many ways, I stumbled into my business. And a lot of this has to do with being a minister, being clergy. It was a challenging calling for me because I did not see women clergy until I went to college. I did not see young people clergy. Everybody was like older. In my home denomination where I started in ministry, I was 19 and the median age of other clergy was 65. This wasn't just like, oh, when you're 19, you think 40 is old. No, people were older. <laughs> they really were. And it, I felt very out of place. Like I didn't fit the norm of what a clergy person should look like, a Black clergy person, even a Black woman clergy person. Um, and so it was something I felt uncomfortable in. I was like, clearly God is having me do this because I would not choose to speak in public at a microphone because I'm the person in the corner reading the book. <laughs> I, am, I am not the person who stands up at the microphone and says holy things. And, but apparently I was. <laughs> and so I did that a bit, but it wasn't something that I saw as this is going to be my primary occupation. So I wrote a book. And my first book, The Dina Project, really came out of my master's thesis. And they came out of the work in ministry I was doing around helping congregations to respond to sexual violence. I am a survivor of sexual violence. I am a clergy person. I'm a theologian. And I saw up close how religious communities didn't know what to do about and with survivors of sexual violence. And I also saw up close how others in helping professions and legal professions and in social work and psychological professions didn't know what to do with religious people who were survivors of sexual violence. And I brought that together in the work I had done for years and spoken about and presented about around the country. And I wrote a book about it. And when I wrote the book, I thought of it as being for regular church folk as being for people like my mother or my aunt who loved me uh, and wanted to know what they could do to help other people in their churches or how they could contribute to this. Of course, we always took financial donations, but really what they could do now that they were aware of this as an issue. And my aunt, who's also my godmother, was like my hype woman. <laughs> when this book came out, she was telling everybody she knew, you have to have my niece come speak at your church. You have to have my niece come speak at your church. And this book came out in 2004. So I was running around speaking in people's churches that my aunt had told about my book. And I was preaching on these controversial passages and hocking my little book at the little table outside the congregation. And I did not know what I was doing, but I was doing it. And I mentioned this to a friend who said, hey, you know, you can get some training at the Woodhull Institute. And I did. And that's how I learned, oh, you should have a contract <laughs> and gave me uh, some ways to kind of formalize the things I was doing. But I still didn't ink myself. I don't know that I thought of it as a business. I just thought I need to be a little tidier in terms of how I do this. And now that I look at it, I was doing that for almost no money, but I felt so passionately about the cause and I was selling them books. And this was before print on demand. So I was like, if this book can just stay in print for five years, I will feel like I have done something. <laughs> and that's really in some ways how it began. I was running around talking about sexual violence in churches and what churches could do, what they could do better and doing workshops where I was invited, where my aunt hyped me up. <laughs> I did not 
I did not know, I didn't plan that people would teach the book. And then I would be invited to talk there about this book and this topic. And so this was turning into a speaking business, but I didn't think of it that way until 2010. So I've been doing this since 2004 and of course preaching before then, but usually not for money. So I don't think that counts. <laughs> and, uh, but I was pre preaching for money after 2004, let's be clear. <laughs> and I was um, on sabbatical and I had had some health challenges. So I had surgery. So I had a six week recovery period. So, you know, you're lying in bed, not going anywhere. And I was reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad <laughs> and by uh, Robert Kiyosaki. And I was like, I need to kind of get my finances together. But, you know, he talked about real estate and these different things. And I'm not selling real estate. That's not my thing. I am an academic. I have ideas. Well, I should, that's, I don't have green widget balls. I need to, I have idea. I need to be selling my ideas. And so um, that's when I inked myself and had, I had a website before then. I actually had a website built when my book came out. So in 2004, and that was when you couldn't build a website yourself. You had to have people who knew HTML build a website. And I had asked all my friends to give $25 each because I was a grad student still. And maybe if they all gave me some money, I could pay for this $1,500 website or whatever it was. Uh, I actually had a friend who just gave me all the money and paid for it. It was very generous um, and really amazing of this person. And so I had a, a kind of, you know, you have to do websites every so often, but I don't think I knew that. So then I had another website done. Uh, this is probably my third website. So the person did my website and now you have web 2.0. There was no web 2.0 on the first website. People couldn't speak back to you. It was just a place to get information. Uh, there's social media now. And the person who built my website did a little social media coaching. And I was so overwhelmed by social media. I was like, I'm supposed to tweet and Facebook and this and have a membership. And I got a job. I got more books to write. And I, it, it was like, whoa. <laughs> it felt like a lot, but that was when I really thought of myself as being a business owner. And I began to more formally uh, with both taxes and laws um, and the way I structured my work to have my business. Um, my business is called Enterprises. And I guess the fun story behind it, which I share with my uh, newsletter list community is that my dad would tease me about having a business because he was a business person. He still wanted me to have a business. I don't know that he ever fully understood that I was in the academy. Like, he's like, you're still in school. I'm like, no, I'm a teacher. But he's like, you're still in school. Like, he didn't quite get when I went from one side of the desk to the other. And he was like, you should have a business. You should call it Coleman Enterprises. And I was like, that sounds so stuffy. Like I'm hauling furniture and big or something and semis across the country. And so... Uh, my father had passed away and um, by 2010, and I used the bit of money I got from his estate, which was not a lot of money, but more money than I had <laughs> to, to start this business. And so thinking of that story, instead of calling it Inter Coleman Enterprises, which was not me, I wanted to call it Inner Prizes because it sounds like enterprises. And also I hope that I get to draw out the gift that is already within people. So that's how I named my business. Uh, I don't talk about the name of it much because I think people just, when you're a speaker, they just look to you, to me as the person. And so I guess I am the brand more than the name of the business, but I still love the name. I'm sitting here chuckling because to me, Coleman Enterprises sounds kind of like on the Jetsons when George Jetson would go work at Sprockets. You know, <laughs> You have meetings with Mr. Sprocket. It's a little too corporate, but right. Enterprises as a play on words is, is something that I understand. It makes me want to ask you, what's been the biggest surprise in terms of you choosing to launch this business that houses your speaking and workshops and training and online classes? How have you made space for or what has been surprising? about that? What didn't you anticipate going into that that has showed up as a really wonderful surprise? Well, I don't think I planned the business. I planned my life, right? I had a vision for my life. I have a deep sense of calling. And so I think about calling and I kind of wrote down my vision and how I wanted to make changes in the world. 
Um, I knew how to do a business plan because I had learned in one of those summer programs I did as a high school student, uh, but I didn't do a business plan. I didn't plan what my business was going to look like. It was like a tax shelter. I was really like, how can I keep my money? When I make money, how could I not be giving all of it to Uncle Sam in the most legal, legit way? Because a sister wants to do some stuff. And that was really how I thought of it. I didn't think like, oh, in my business, I'm going to do X, I'm going to do Y. So I think the biggest surprise has been all the things I now do with the business, right? I wanted to write a book. So I self-published that through the business. Uh, so one of my books is self-published through the business and the business is a publisher. I teach online classes. I did not think that I would be doing that, even though it makes so much sense because I love teaching. Um, you know, I have other resources I'm able to do through the business. And so I didn't picture that. I didn't know who I would be speaking for. I thought I'd always be speaking in churches. Now I rarely speak in churches. You know, more of my work is with maybe the denomination as a whole of a church or universities and some kind of corporate size nonprofits. So I didn't imagine that, I think, because I didn't imagine any of it. I just thought, well, I want to live out my calling. And this was a vehicle through which I could do that. But initially I was like, oh, it's a tax shelter. <laughs> this is a way for me to like keep my money because I didn't like the tax rate I was getting before I inked myself. Along those lines, then, you know, it makes me want to ask, you have quite the reputation nationally and internationally as a scholar. People are not unfamiliar with you or your work. And it makes me wonder how you navigated the anxiety that sometimes comes up when we're talking to people who are thinking about launching a business in addition to their kind of academic profile. Did you have sleepless nights about credibility or what any of this was going to do to your reputation? Or were you so kind of vision grounded and mission led that it didn't matter? I think it was the latter. You know, I like being an academic. I am not an unhappy academic. I mean, there are moments, of course, right? Like when you're grading. But generally speaking, the academia is the right career for me. I enjoy it. I think I do well enough at it. I like nerding out over my topic and I like coming at it in different ways. I was a writer before I was an academic, so I enjoy writing and I enjoy the research and I generally enjoy teaching. Uh, and I've had the chance to do this in different contexts, different kinds of students. I've had really, really great students, really great mentors, really great colleagues. The academy has basically been good to me, I have to say. And I've had sufficient funding through writing grants and different things to do a lot of the work I wanted to do. I think the calling part was harder. And um, trying to, you know, orient my life around where I think God or the divine or is calling me. And that part wasn't hard, but sometimes the answer, the call was like, you want me to what? <laughs> that was the harder part. And I came to accept that I was not called to pastor, which I'm very happy about. But that, again, was the only kind of ministry I heard a lot about, or maybe being a campus minister or being a prison chaplain or a hospital chaplain. I knew about those. Um, my ministry was to break silences, was to talk about things other people didn't talk about, to try to offer others the resources I didn't have that I needed and that I knew I wasn't the only one who needed. Um, to, to harness those experiences, to hopefully transform how other people experience God and faith and community. And that often makes me really vulnerable. And even as I became comfortable with it, this was very much against the traditional way you're supposed to operate in the academy. And a lot of very cher cherished mentors would tell me I was doing the wrong thing or not to do it in this way, and that I was tanking my career. And when people you like and respect say that, that hurts. And there were some costs to going against the wisdom and advice of some prominent senior scholars or scholars who were senior to me. I guess they still are, they're still alive, still senior to me at the time. So those were risky things to do. I don't know that I felt risky. I felt vulnerable. And I felt like 
okay, here we go, God, you got me because they ain't got me. (laughs) So in that sense, you know, I didn't, I don't feel any um, business anxiety, I guess, because for me, it was a structure um, by which to house the things I love to do and that I feel called to do. And at a certain point, you get to, at least I'll say, I got to a place in my academic career, but there are certain paths people expect you to take. And, you know, you kind of get to different milestones um, in the academy and you look at yourself and say, what do I want to do? You say, do I want to keep doing this? (laughs) Do I not want to keep doing this? You know, every couple of years, I'm like, screw it all. I don't need to do this shit. (laughs) And I come back to it. Um, I'm a Leo. I get bored easily. So I'm like, well, that was fun. Now what? And so (laughs) <laughs> that does happen every so often. And I said, well, what do I want to do? Do I want to take path A or path B? And I was like, no, I don't like path A or path B. Those sound like terrible things to do with my life. I don't want to be in meetings all day. I don't care how much money you give me. I have to work in the summer. What? No, 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 no. Nobody wants to do that. And so um, I said, you know, I love when I do this other stuff. It's not my job. It gives me life. I don't even know if I'm good at it, but I like it. And other people say they like it. So I'm going to lean into that. And that's kind of how I, what I did with my business. I kind of leaned more into using it as a place in which I can live out the things that bring me much life and that feel a deep sense of purpose for me and that other people seem to find transformative. And that really excites me and encourages me to keep going. Given everything that you've shared today with our listeners, which I find so warm and wonderful and inspiring, it really makes me want to ask, what are you looking forward to? When you think about your business a year from now, 18 months from now, three years from now, five years from now, what is it that you're looking forward to doing or exploring or achieving as an entrepreneur that continues to encourage you and have you chugging along in this space, given all the other things you could be doing? You know, my first thought when you said that was more money. Um, (laughs) And it sounds so bad. Um, I mean, yeah, (laughs) I do mean more money. Um, Not because I'm a a hard capitalist, but because... I have things that I have things to do that require money. I have a child uh, whose dreams I want to help come true. I want to retire and I can see it. I'm closer to retirement than the beginning of my career. And so I don't want to be teaching two, two and going to faculty meetings when I'm 70. I do not want to be doing that. Right. (laughs) I will be doing fun, compelling, interesting, smart work, but God, not that. And so like that has to come to an end. Um, I discovered vacations recently where you go places and you don't work and you let the sun hit your skin and you hang out with people you like. I was like, oh, this is great. And so um, in some ways, yeah, I want to, I want, I have some financial goals that I want to meet and sustain that will allow me to do some of those things. But in terms of the content of my business, you know, I plan, but I'm not holding on to the plan tightly. I want to, kind of expand the scope of what I do. I guess expand the reach is really the answer. I I love what I do and I want to reach more people doing it. Um, I teach classes online because I felt like I know this really cool way of thinking about faith and religion. And I teach it to like 15 graduate students, <laughs> 15 people who have the chance to get this far in their education when I think it's really cool and lots of people might like it. And so I want to expand that even more, get to more people and share um, what I think is cool with more people. Um, I want to continue speaking, right? And maybe to a wider audience than I currently have, or even a different audience than I currently have. And, you know, I'm open to surprise. Uh, As many of you know, I had this great project with Tanana Reeve Du um, around Octavia Butler during the pandemic. Neither one of us saw that happening, Um, but it was so much fun and it was completely in alignment with the things that I value and what I, you know, the things that I have talked about in my business. I didn't see AB3 happening. Um, So I, you know, I'm 
partner with friends on great projects. And that's not something I'm like, you know, I see this happening in five years. I think it's a kind of openness to the things that align with my vision um, and letting that be monetized in such a way that it can complement, right, the, the career that I have in the academy. Okay, let's get it. Let's hear it. Somebody's out there listening. Some person who's been a fan of yours forever. Some person who's just discovering you today and is doing their Googles because they've been so inspired by everything you've had to share. What's that message that you want to leave with listeners who are maybe on the fence about pursuing an entrepreneurial dream or who are um, established academics who want to strike out and perhaps have some anxiety about doing so? What's the one thing you would tell them to perhaps get them over that hump? You know, I think I would share with people one of the core messages that we share in academic business and branding, brain trust. And that is to be led by your own vision, right? Um, because I'm a religious person, I call that a calling, right? And I, um, I have changed entire directions in life because of a sense of calling. And so I am very much led by calling. I know that everyone thinks of it in that term because of whatever their religious background is. And I have never thought of a calling as things that ministers get. Um, I was very, I think, hesitant to go into ministry for that reason, because I was like, well, everybody should be called to what they do, right? I didn't think calling equals being a preacher. I thought, well, if I have an attorney, I hope they're called to be an attorney. <laughs> and I'm like, God calls everybody to something, whether that's your job or it's not your job, right? I grew up with people where church was where they lived out their calling, even if they had blue collar jobs during the day, their day jobs, right? But it was in their religious spaces where they could live out whatever their true calling is or was. So I don't think that calling necessarily equals job. I have the joy and the privilege of having making money at the thing that is my calling is having a job aligned with my calling. And that is rare and it is precious. And so, but I do think everyone should have a vision, whether that's what your job is or not. And to be led by that vision, because jobs come and go, institutions come and go. You know, during the pandemic, we got this email that was like, so if you die, can you leave like lesson plans? And it was like, for real? But it's just saying, you know, we like you and all, but the institution's got to keep going. We still got students here. Like, what you going to do? And it, it felt a little harsh because it was, but it's a way of saying that they will replace us. Like, you know, I am a faculty line. There, there is no like, I think my colleagues like me, my chair likes me, but the institution don't know me. Like I am a way to save money. I'm a way to, if I go somewhere, they can just rotate that back into the operating budget, you know, and hold on to that for a year or two and then douse out some faculty line in a junior rank. You know what they do. And so it's a job. I like my job. Um, pretty good amount. <laughs> but I think to be driven by your vision for how you're going to change the world, because I think all of us can change the world. And we have gotten into our careers because we're good at something, but also because it transformed us and we want to transform other people. And to think intentionally about your vision for your life, your vision for the world, your vision for your impact in the world, and to be led by that, because you know, you can fill in the other pieces. You can fill in the business part. We help with that at AB3. You can fill in your business offerings. You can fill in the job. But it also means that there's not one way to do it. So that if it doesn't go the way you hoped it would go, because I mean, really, who's on plan A? I'm like on plan G, right? <laughs> like Not even plan B. Like I'm not on the plan I thought I would have, um, but I'm still living out this vision, right? This calling, uh, at least living out parts of it in different aspects of my life. And so I would tell people, be driven by that, right? Know, know that part uh, and not so much this one particular thing that we don't have enough control over, right? I mean, it's a matter, it's a, it's a miracle anyone has an academic job. <laughs> there are so many factors that you cannot control. They go into who gets hired, who doesn't get hired, um, and the way, you know, the academia works as an industry 
as much as it is a place for education, maybe more so even, um, that it has to be your vision. And so that's what I would say, be led by that. Thank you so much for being with us today as a guest and not as a co-host. I am certain that this episode will inspire and encourage people towards the fulfillment of their own entrepreneurial vision. Um, it was also exciting to hear you talk about the serendipitous parts that were not all about you having a plan. Um, as a person who tends to love a plan, <laughs> likes to have a plan for a plan, sometimes you just can't engineer it. You know, life is going to do what life does, life be life. In. And so it was really refreshing to hear you just be totally authentic about that and how even in the midst of all these things we can't predict and circumstances that are less than ideal, you've still managed to chart a pathway for your vision in the world. And I'm touched by that. I know our listeners will be too. So thank you. It's been great to be a guest and you will hear us as hosts again on the next episode. Thank you for joining us for this episode of AB3 Speaks with Monica and Takia. We do this podcast because we want to serve and support Black academic women's entrepreneurial dreams. So subscribe and leave us a rating and review on iTunes or Spotify or wherever you listen to your podcast. We read every one, and this will help others to find the show. If you're looking to take the next step in your career, go to blackademicbraintrust.com where you can join our amazing community and get our free resource on the 12 questions you should ask yourself before becoming a Black academic entrepreneur. Our mission is to nurture your entrepreneurial dreams within and beyond the academy and build a business that both sustains and offers you freedom. We look forward to you finding and joining us at blackademicbraintrust.com. Because we want you to win. Thank you.